So I've been planning this video for quite some time. Um, I really wanted to make a video that describes in more detail this um, torus geometry that I've been playing around with and showing you guys, you know, little clips here and there, but not really giving you, you know, the full picture. And so, um, in order to do that, what I want to do is maybe tell you a little story, tell you the processes that I went through, um, some, you know, interesting, an interesting path that I took um, over the Christmas holidays, um, you know, because I had a lot of time. I was on holidays for quite some time and I had a lot of time to, um, to work on this. And so, you know, I... I had just bought a brand new laptop and so I was really excited to, you know, put it through its paces and um, make it do what computers do best and do some math. Okay, so computers are really good at doing math and I really wanted to make my computer do some math. So I showed you today, earlier today, um, just a quick sketch of what I'm trying to do. Uh, I told you that one of my viewers, one of my, um, I, I'm going to say friend and colleague, was wondering if I could um, animate this in a more of a flow uh, way, so to make it look like water is flowing down the drain. But I'm not going to get into this right now. I'm just uh, showing you this now while I introduce what I want to talk about in this video. Okay, so so how did I get into the, the Taurus structure and, you know, a lot of people are into it. It's a big, um, it's become quite popular, let's say. And so many, many years ago, I want to point you to this website. It's called www.horntaurus.com. And uh, it is uh, this mathematician, um, his name is Wolfgang W., um, I'm going to say um, Dalmer or da Darmler. I really don't know how to say your name. I apologize in advance. But um, this website I uh, ran across many years ago. And of course, I was really intrigued. I'm going to just read you this introduction and I'll, you know, you'll understand why I found this website intriguing. Okay, so he says the geometrical horn torus model is a proposal for a different approach to physical, oops, sorry about that, physical questions by the attempts to describe fundamental, fundamental physical processes graphically, namely in the form of dynamically interlaced horn tori. So this is a horn torus. It's called a horn torus because it's got a, a horn in the middle, and that's just one kind of Taurus geometry that uh, I have been showing you. Okay, so he he says um, these are eminently suitable to illustrate complex numbers and their manifold properties. When the imaginary part is represented by numbers connected to the revolutions around the Taurus bulge, and so what he means by that is actually um, what I call the turns through the Taurus. So the turns through the torus that go through the horn are uh, he corresponds to imaginary numbers and then he says the real part um, are correspond to the rotations around the main symmetry the latitudes okay so so around the main uh, uh, symmetry axis so this is the main symmetry axis and um, I'm assuming he's talking about the saying that the real component is the turns around the torus and the imaginary component is the turns through the torus. So um, this is really worth studying. I think it's really interesting and I would like to find out more about it. But I highly recommend this, this website. There's a lot of information in here. He also he relates um, this torus geometry to the electron, which I find really interesting. And so this is from one of the pages on his website. And this is what I was trying to replicate 
when I made the one video. So there was a video I made that looks kind of like this where it's flowing through and spinning around its, its main axis. Um, mine is in yellow and this is in red. I took some artistic liberties um, when I made my video. And so really what I'm interested in here, and this can spin either way, but this is the direction that I like it to be spinning in. Okay, so um, this is spinning counterclockwise, uh, and this would be the North Pole, and the South Pole would be down here. So that's just an arbitrary choice, really. It could be the other way, but this is my preferred choice. And I'll explain later why. I'll show you exactly why I think this, um, this is the way this is meant to spin. So um, what I'm interested in are the intersections where these the vertical and horizontal lines intersect. So I'm going to show you another video, another animation from his website, okay, from um, Wolfgang's website. And so what he's showing here is this is the path that a point on the tor on this spinning torus, this is the path that it takes as it spins around the torus and spins through the torus. And of course, this has to do with the the number of turns around, the number of times the torus is spinning compared to the number of times the torus is, the point is going through the horn. Okay, and I'm going to show you that with my software. Okay, here's my software. And here is, um, here are all the parameters. So I'm going to set them all to zero for now. And I'm going to show you just one thing at a time. Actually, I'm going to set, so I'm going to set the turns around to one. So that's trivial. When the turns around are equal to one, you just get a circle. Okay, now I'm going to set it to zero and I'm going to set the turns through. So when the turns through are equal to one, then you still just get a circle. But that circle is going around the donut. Okay, so I'm going to do one turn around and one turn through, and that's what you get. And I'm going to increase now the number of turns through. So now you can see, now you can see, there's just one turn around and a bunch of turns through. And so the next thing I'm going to show you is this offset parameter, because the offset parameter is what determines um, how big the hole is in the middle. And so when the offset is equal to one, when offset is equal to one, you get the horn torus, you get the horn, but hard, but barely. There's like no hole, there's a horn, but there's really, there's no hole. So if I make the horn, if I make the offset a little bit bigger, then now you have a hole. So really what's happening here with this offset is I'm just making the, the two um, circles, the two, you know, cross sections of the donut further and further apart. And so I'm going to bring them closer together and I'm going to bring them further apart. Okay. So when you go past one, when you go smaller than one, so when the offset is equal to one, there's no hole. When the offset is less than one, then you get the spindle. So now you have the spindle torus. And of course, you might recognize that as the toroflex. So the spindle torus is, for all intents and purposes, the toroflex. And so this is with one turn around and 20 turns through. And I think the Toro Flux that I have, and I think the one depicted in this image is one turn around and 13, 13 turns around and one, or sorry, one turn around and 13 turns through. So 13 turns through the torus. So it goes through the middle 13 times, but it only goes around once. And so that's, you know, how you make the Toro Flux. Now I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to make the turns through equal to one 
and I'm going to increase the turns around. So when you do that, basically what you get are um, just horizontal lines. And when you do, you know, when you increase the turns through and have only one turn around, then the lines are vertical. And so those are the two lines that you see in this geometry. You've got the turns through the torus are the vertical lines, and the turns around are the horizontal lines. And here you've got a bunch of horizontal lines. I've got 29 turns around and just one turn through. And of course, and there, it looks kind of like a spring. It's uh, really kind of neat. And so you can have all kinds of variations. You can have 59 turns through, 42 turns through and 59 turns around and that's what you get. Right? Or you could have, um, you know, a neat thing like that where it's 20 turns through and 15 turns around and that's kind of a neat shape. And I'm going to open that up a bit and I'm going to create a hole in the middle. So now you have a donut with a hole with an offset of 1.7. So I'm going to shrink that down a bit so you can see it. And so there is your, this is a horn torus, but with a very wide um, horn. It's basically got a giant hole in the middle. And uh, notice the, you know, basically you've got the hyper trochoid pattern that you see would see under the ferrocell. If you had lights all the way around this and this was a ferrocell, this is pretty close to the pattern you would see. And so, you know, a lot of what I'm doing is, you know, trying to figure out what is the geometry of the ferrocell, why is it producing that particular pattern, and um, I also just really like this um, geometry. So the other interesting thing I want to point out is that you know, all the tori that I've studied, the so you've got the horn torus, which is this, then you've got the spindle torus, which is, you know, it's got the spindle in the middle, it's like a pregnant um, torus, it's got like a bulge in the middle, and uh, this, obviously there would be no hole in this. And then you got, so if I take the offset right down to zero, then the, um, basically the spindle, the spindle and the outer torus are the same size. So they are now coincident. And as I make this bigger, you will see that the outside, the outside of the torus gets smaller as the inside gets bigger. And this, I believe, um, the inside, I believe, corresponds to the dielectric component that Ken Wheeler talks about that we see under the ferrocell. And the outer would be analogous to or corresponds to the magnetic. And so that makes sense. So we, we do know that, and I've seen this myself under the ferrocell, that when you get a really strong magnet, the dielectric component increases and the magnetic field, the um, distance that the magnetic field throws is gets smaller, although the magnet gets stronger. So um, the magnet gets stronger as the dielectric gets stronger, it uh, gets bigger and the magnetic gets stronger. It, it basically is compressing. So, um, so this is basically, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, I'm gonna show you the, the code I use to generate this. It's super, super simple. Okay, so you've got, I have, so each tube, right, each uh, torus is just one tube. Each torus is just one tube, one tube. 
and the more turns and the more the more turns I put into it the more complex it looks but it just looks complex but each one of these is 2,000 points I, I, I use 2,000 points and I follow the trajectory of them all the way around the torus so each one of these is 2,000 points no matter if it looks like that like that or like that right or like that no matter how filled in it is or no matter how open it is it is still 2,000 points and then what I do is I integrate over one cycle so I go for the phase equals 0 to 1 cycle and 1 cycle is 2 pi 2 pi is 1 cycle and I integrate I integrate by a small amount each time. So I calculate my dt, which would be just at a small distance, um, which is 2 pi divided, divided by the number of points. So I'm going through the cycle, I'm integrating, just like you do in calculus, over the cycle. And then I calculate the radius, and the rate, and there's my offset. So the offset from my software gets applied to the radius, and when the offset gets bigger, the you get a bigger donut hole. And when the offset is when the offset is smaller, you get um, a smaller hole, and or a spindle, or it all converges to one object. Um, the z-axis is also controlled. So the the radius is is con controlled by the turns through. So the the slider bar that I called turns through, that controls the radius. Z is also controlled by the turns through. So Z would be in this direction. Okay, Z is in this direction and this would be X and Y. X and Y. So you can see, I don't know if you can see my little things here, but uh, I've got a little axis here and Z is this way and X and Y are orthogonal to that. So there's x and y. And so x and y, x and y are controlled by the turns around the torus. Turns around the torus. So that's basically how this is done. It's pretty straightforward, uh, not rocket science by any stretch of the imagination. But it's still fun and I really like the fact that it's so simple. So I'm going to go through um, my little journey that I took over the holidays. Okay, so um, one of my viewers sent me a video, and the video was an awards ceremony for the Fundamental Physics Prize. And you can see here there's a little um, art artsy sketch in this background here um, which is this is a little sketch of the prize that they give when they give out this award and this is what the prize looks like obviously it is a Taurus knot but it's uh, okay here's another close-up of it so here you can see that this prize is um, fairly spherical. It's really, really very spherical. It's not perfectly spherical, but um, so uh, I felt very compelled to want to, when I first saw it, I thought, no, that's kind of weird. But then I realized, okay, so I have to figure out how to replicate this. I really want to replicate this. Uh, somebody else wanted me to replicate this as well, and so I had some incentive to uh, to give this a go while I was on holidays and I had lots of time on my hands. And so it bothered me because the spindle torus, the spindle torus, um, without um, any trickery or whatever, as it is on its own, as I showed you, as you can see here, even with the smallest spindle, even with the smallest spindle, like spindle of one, which is barely no spindle, it is not spherical. It is not spherical. So, you know, how, how do you make this spherical? Um, 
And so there is one way, there is one way to make this spherical. And the way to make it spherical is to, um, is to make the offset equal to zero, which I showed you, I made the offset equal to zero. But when you do that, when you do that, you, there's no spindle. See, there's nothing inside there because the spindle is coincident with, it's exactly the same size as the outer, tor of, outer edge of the torus. And so that is why it, you know, there's no torus, but it looks spherical. So that's still, which is really cool. I think that this means something. I think this is important that this is perfectly spherical. This is exactly spherical as you can see here. So when I map my normal torus with a spindle onto a sphere, it's not even close. These edges don't match up. They don't line up with the circle and it's obviously not spherical. But my torus in this animation, in this video with an offset of zero is exactly spherical. It's perfectly spherical, but it doesn't have a spindle. So it's still not, it's still not this. So, you know, how, how to deal with that? That, you know, kind of bothered me. I really wanted to figure it out. So, um, basically what I did was I took my code and I said, okay, so as a first iteration, I thought what I would do is, um, cause obviously it's the, it was the Z axis that was problematic. It's the Z axis is, is what is too short in the normal torus, right? The Z is stretched out. And so, um, I thought, well, what could I do to fix that? And so I thought, okay, so obviously one approach would be to scale the Z axis, either make Z bigger or make X and Y smaller. My first approach was to make X and Y smaller. It doesn't really matter which way you go. The nicer way I think is to make Z bigger. So I made a first initial guess. No, I didn't. I made a few guesses and then I finally came to the conclusion that as I tried two and it was too big and I tried 1.5 and it was too small and I thought, oh, what if I try 1.618, which is phi, which is the, um, the golden ratio number. And so when I did that, when I did that, I did get something that looked a little more spherical. It did look a little more spherical, but it really, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. And I'm going to show you, um, let's see if I can get back to my PowerPoint here. Okay. So I did, I took this model, you know, and it does match this model now very nicely. I found the right number of turns and I even modeled this other, um, this other, uh, little curve in here, which is also a torus, which is also comes from my torus, not algorithm from my software. So I was even able to model that, but it didn't, it still didn't look right. It didn't look spherical to me. It didn't look spherical to me. So, you know, I kind of gave up for about three minutes because I don't give up. Uh, I do give up and then I don't give up. So I, when I give up, it's usually very temporary because all I needed to do was go for a walk and go, oh, I think I know what's going on. And so here's what I did. I took this and I generated a, a 3D model, a real 3D model, and I loaded it into, let's see if I have it here. Yeah, there it is. I loaded it into um, a program called MeshLab. Now MeshLab is a software tool for visualizing STL models or solid models. Um, and so I generated an STL file noted in here and gosh, and by golly, it looked more spherical, even though it's exactly the same model. It's exactly the same model. It looks way more spherical. And so uh, I did a little digging and discovered that the toolkit that I use 
to um, display the surfaces. It's called Visualization Toolkit or VTK for short. This is the software that I've been using for, for years for, um, for generating and modeling um, 3D surfaces. Does a parallel projection it does a parallel projection. Whereas the Mesh Lab and other modeling software, but Mesh Lab does a perspective um, projection. And so the, the um, perspective projection gives you a more realistic um, projection. It makes it look more like the 3D model than you would with a parallel projection. Now, there's, there are some advantages to parallel projection, especially in medical imaging, which is, you know, what I do for a living. And so this is why we use, and we use this toolkit because, you know, it, it's readily available and easy to use. So, um, and it doesn't, you know, the fact that it does parallel projection doesn't really affect um, the, the software that, I, that I'm writing. So, um, so that was it. So I was, you know, really happy because I realized that my model is actually, this is actually fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It might not be perfect. It's still not perfect, even when you look at it in this view, but it is a lot more spherical. And so it's a lot more pleasing. And I'm, I'm quite sure that the actual 3D model, if you printed it out, would be, um, would be really cool. In fact, what I did for you all and for myself because I think I'm going to buy one I think I'm going to get one is I took my 3D model and I uploaded it to um, I uploaded it to Shapeways I have a whole bunch of 3D models up here um, and I rendered it I with a bunch of different materials and so this is um, uh, rod rhodidium plated brass which I thought looked a lot like the uh, model that I was trying to replicate. Okay, so there it is, and there it is. So, um, anyway, so I did succeed in replicating this model. I think I think pretty accurately, um, and so and it does look very, much more spherical when it's using the projective, um, uh, the perspective projection that makes it look more like a 3D model. Okay, so I'm going to get back to, I'm going to get back to uh, something really interesting. So what I did, so here's an image that someone sent me, or a reminiscent of an image that actually Tim Vendorelli sent me um, an email. Um, I think it was this image that he sent me. So he sent me an email with this image, which is, um, which has to do with something called the tokamak. So when I was trying to figure out the spherical um, torus geometry, which you know was really confounding me for a few days, I did a search for spherical torus, and I found the National Spherical Torus Experiment. Okay, the National Spherical Torus Experiment is a magnetic fusion device, a magnetic fusion device based on the spherical tokamak concept, okay? It was constructed by uh, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. So plasma physics is involved in this. So what is a tokamak? A tokamak is a device which uses a powerful magnetic field to combine hot plasma in the shape of a torus. Okay, the tokamak is one of several types of magnetic confinement devices. So this is a magnetic confinement devices developed to produce and control fusion power. So this is relatively new. As of uh, 2016, it is the leading candidate for a practical fusion reactor. And the spherical tomac, um, tokamak, um, right, the spherical tokamak is, you know, basically... Uh, very reminiscent of this um, spherical geometry, of the torus geometry, and obviously, obviously, the people that are running the fundamental, fundamental 
physics prize were using uh, base their model on the tokamak, the spherical tokamak. And you can see they even have, there's something, this line here, this, this line here seems to be very, a very important part of this um, plasma generator. Okay, so here is a little cartoon of it. And obviously this um, geometry, this extra coil, this extra coil of whatever it is, this wire, this extra coil, is an important part of this tokamak. Um, tokamak um, design. And here's a cartoon of the tokamak reactor. So here, we'll go back to this. So basically what I did was I, uh, let me just click on here. So um, I just superimposed my image uh, with, the, with, the to with this plasma generated from the tokamak and um, the plasma field and you can see that you know the curves that I generate with this now more spherical um, this more spherical torus geometry matches very nicely with the tokamak um, plasma the lines from the plasma generator so I think this is really cool. There they are side by side, and you can see this curve here really matches nicely with this, but also the curves in this, um, this plasma very much do line up nicely. Although, you know, on the right, it's very, you know, my ideal model is, you know, not as, is maybe too perfect. And, you know, um, I don't expect them to match up perfectly, but they're pretty darn good. And here it is again. And here's another alpha blending. Right, there's there's my spherical model. This is my other spherical model, not the spindle one, but the one where I made the offset zero. And you know, the curves do line up pretty nicely as well. So this curvature is kind of ubiquitous in a um, lot of the models that um, come out of my Taurus geometry, my software. There's another one. And there is my model from Shapeway, or sorry, my model from Mesh Lab so beside the model that they made and you know so I think I, I think I nailed it I think I got it pretty good um, let's see and this of course is the model from my Shapeways store so I will try to remember to put the links for all these things into the description especially for this Shapeway model um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to show you Oh yeah, I just want to finish off with this because this is what I worked on today. This is um, this is uh, sort of colorizing the tubes. So I applied a a color palette to the tubes, and uh, you can kind of see the the flowing going on and. The thing that's really neat about this, let me, I'm going to go to something with, with a small spindle there. Okay. Or a small, uh, yeah. So basically, and I'm just going to tone this down a little bit so you can see the flow rate. Okay. So I'm going to turn this around and what I want to show you is that this, the way it's flowing, the way I have the parameters set up, um, the the positive parameters. So all the par all the parameters are positive in this model, and when all the parameters are positive in this model, the flow looks like it's going counterclockwise. Okay, so it's going it's going up, it's coming out, and it's spinning counterclockwise. And uh, if I think if I do more turns through and less turns around you'll see it better yeah so you can see that um, 
it's flowing up around and down and it is moving counterclockwise when I um, complexify the surface you can really see that it's spinning count counterclockwise it's definitely spinning counterclockwise and it's definitely moving up it's moving up the spindle out spinning around counterclockwise so I think this is the correct geometry for the positive condition uh, whatever that means so basically I'm saying that all the parameters in my software are positive. If I want to get it to spin in the opposite direction, I would go like that. I would make Z negative if I want to make it spin in the opposite direction. So, you know, spin, the torus is not spinning. That's the other thing I wanted to point out. The torus is not spinning. It is static. The lines are not moving. Uh, basically what I'm simulating here is as if these are tubes, as if these are tubes of, uh, with fluid flowing through them. And if I go right down to one turn around, you will see, you will see that um, the fluid is just spinning and it's only one turn. It's only one turn, which is why it's going so slow. If I add more turns, it'll spin much faster but uh, that's not as much fun as looking at it like that. So again, I um, just want to point out that the fluid, let's pretend it's fluid, the fluid is flowing up the spindle or up the horn. Let's make it a spindle. There, it's flowing up the spindle and counterclockwise and then through the bottom. So it's coming up, it's going into the bottom, into the bottom, flowing up. So th this animation effect is really cool. I'm really, you know, happy. Thank you to the Good Vibrations, the Good Vibrations guy for encouraging me to do this because uh, I'm gonna have a lot of fun with it. I think it's really neat. And added a little bit of transparency, a little opacity to this model so that you could kind of, you could see through it a little bit. Because um, when you don't do that, the, these front lines in front were blocking the, being able to see the spindle in the middle. And I really wanted to see the flow going up in, uh, in the middle part. So that is so much fun. Anyways, I think I'm going to leave it at that. This is like, you know, a longer video than I really wanted to make, but I wanted to, I'm just going to do a quick review of everything we've done today. Okay. We talked about the, um, the horn, uh, .com website and that I was able to fairly accurately replicate this, this model. Uh, I noticed that they added a bunch more turns in the middle, and I think that was to reinforce the model. So um, their model isn't really, you know, I think they have a bunch of things going on in here, but uh, as far as the me being able to generate this geometry, um, I think I did a pretty good job considering, um, you know, I was doing this from scratch. And definitely there is a phi relationship. And this is one other thing I wanted to point out here that um, Ken Wheeler, Ken Wheeler always talks about how the, phi, the um, dielectric component of the magnetic field, and there's only one field, it's just a magnetic field. So the dielectric component of the magnetic field is 1.618 times stronger than the magnetic. So the dielectric is 1.618 times stronger than the magnetic. And he also refers to the dielectric as the z-axis dielectric. So he refers to the z-axis as the dielectric. And so my software does seem to confirm what he's saying. Um, this is something that is worth studying because 
uh, it seems that the 1.618 ratio uh, gives us this spherical geometry that, um, that they seem to want to use in the tokamak in the fusion reactor because apparently it's more efficient. There are some good reasons for using the spherical geometry for the tokamak. And so, um, so that was my, that was my journey. That was my journey over the holidays. It, uh, I think, um, the results are really good. And I think that this is really a good direction to go. I think this is an important, um, piece of the puzzle. And, you know, I hope you enjoyed this video. Ciao for now.